So my name's Chris. I'm just a guy that goes to this church. I'm not your pastor, uh, but I'm filling in for Jeremy, and Jeremy is on a uh, much-deserved vacation, and I understand his vacation includes renovating a bathroom. So we need to uh, have a conversation with him about how to actually take a break and a vacation, but I am happy to fill in for him this morning. Um, I feel like I've been quite hit and miss the last couple months. I've been traveling a fair bit. I was in Guatemala for the month of December, uh, doing some missions and ministry there. And then I, just as we were getting, as I was getting settled back in in January, I was off to India. And so I've been, I was in India for two weeks and have been back for a little while and still trying to get my feet on my ground. So um, this morning, what I want to talk about is missions. Um, I want to just share stories about what God is doing around the world. I know when I was a kid and a youth, I loved it when a guy stood up and talked about what God is doing globally. For me, it just sparked my imagination and got me so excited about being a Christian and being excited about what God is doing. Sometimes uh, we get stuck in our little bubble and we don't really think beyond Lake Country or the Okanagan. And so I'm, I'm hoping this morning we can just expand uh, our understanding of what God is doing. And so as I was thinking about this morning, my hope and my prayer is that uh, you walk away from here inspired, you walk away from here challenged, you walk away from here just motivated that God is at work and you get to be a part of that. We are not, and missions is not just something that happens out there. You don't have to get on a plane to do missions. We are all called to be missionaries. We're called to live missionally. And so I get the privilege to travel and actually see, and see what God's doing in other parts of the world. But the reality is we're all called to be engaged in the mission of God. So hopefully through the stories that I tell this morning, it will just spark a, a passion and a renewed passion for what God's doing and your participation in it. So this is not really a sermon. It's more of a missions report. And it's actually going to be a bit of a history lesson. So I hope that you're into that. But as we start, we are going to frame what I want to say with some scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. It's kind of the heart of the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a book about wisdom. And the author says this, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. So God has created everything. God is the creator of everything, but more specifically, he's the creator of human beings. And m more specifically than that, he has put eternity in human beings' hearts. That we were created by God for God. That deep down inside, all of us, there is this longing for more. There's this longing for more than what the world can offer us. Uh, this physical world is not enough. It does not satisfy us. And we have been created for more. We've been created for eternity. That's what, this, uh, that's what this passage is saying to us. It is astounding to me that every civilization in history, every society, as far as you look back, has had some sort of religious system set up in it. That it is evidence that we are all spiritual beings. So in Guatemala, we take our students to Mayan ruins. And at the heart of the Mayan ruins, at the very center of the civilization, is their religious system. I see the same thing when I go to India. We go to these old ruins and, and we learn about what their civilizations were like. And it was all, so much of it was centered around their religious and their spiritual practices. You look at the ancient Greeks or the ancient Romans or the ancient Egyptians and their religious systems were, were so much a part of who they were as a people. What does that tell you? It tells me that this passage is true, that eternity is in our hearts, and we're all looking for something beyond what this world can give us. All civilizations, all societies, all people have done that. And to me, this is one of the greatest evidences that God exists. How else do you explain it? How else do you explain the fact that all of us, all humans throughout all of history have looked for transcendence, have looked for meaningful answers to deeper questions about why we're here and what this is all about. God has placed eternity in our hearts and we can just see that by looking at history and civilizations and people groups. The other passage, Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. So this is what theologians would call general revelation. It is the idea that God has made himself known to all people simply through the observance of nature. That 
uh, as we look outside and we see the intricacies and the complexities of the world around us, that points us to the fact that there must be a great creator behind it all. So that's general revelation. And then, of course, there's specific revelation. And specific revelation is, is God's revelation to us in Christ. And he wants to make himself known specifically through Christ, as we understand through the scriptures. But generally, the passage here is telling us that no one has an excuse, that there is evidence for God just by simply looking out there and seeing, uh, seeing what, what you're looking at. So the job of missions is to help alert people to what's already happening in their hearts and their minds. God is at work, and missionaries are just trying to help people realize how God is working in them. The job of the missionary is to point people to the answers that they are asking, the, the questions that are deep down within them, and the answers that we see, uh, even just by looking at creation, that there is a God behind all of this. So I was in India a month ago. Three weeks ago, I was, I was in a church in Punjab, so I spent two weeks traveling around India. The organization that I lead, we support uh, lots of missionaries around the world, but uh, one of our main focuses is in India. And so we support indigenous national church planters in India, and we help them evangelize a community and plant a new church. And the focus is to plant churches where churches have never existed before. So it's very much frontier missions work. And when I go to India, this was my 11th trip in the last nine years. So when I go there, I'm just always so encouraged about what God, what God is doing. And I go, to, I go to places that I've been to before, but every trip I always try to go somewhere new, somewhere different, so that I get a better sense of what the Lord is doing. And so this trip I went to, um, I went to uh, an eastern state called West Bengal, uh, and, that, and I was about five and a half hours north of Calcutta, if you know India. And so I want to tell you a little bit about my trip here. So um, we went and visited a group of people, they're tribal people called the Santal people. I didn't know anything about them, and so when they told me, you're going to be going here, and the work is amongst these tribal people called the Santalis, I was like, well, I may as well learn a little bit about the Santali people. So I started doing some research before my trip, and as I was researching, I discovered something that was absolutely mind-blowing, and I had to buy some books and keep researching and like fact-check it because it was so absolutely incredible. It was one of the most amazing stories that I've come across. And so I want to tell you the Santali history. So Santal people. Introduce you to two missionaries, Lars Skresfrud, I try to say that five times, and Hans Burst. And these guys came from Norway. And India opened up its doors to missionaries in 1863. And these Europeans went into India and they were called to reach the Santali people. So it was kind of first European contact, 1863. And uh, Lars Grisfrud was a linguist. And so he learned the language very, very quickly and became a master of the Santali language. So they moved into India, they built a mission station and uh, wanted to understand and learn the culture and understand the language before they presented Christ to them. So as Lars was learning the language, and he had a really good grasp on it, he sat down with the elders of the Santali people, and he said, tell me about your history. Tell me about your traditions. What is it that you believe as a people group? And the elder told him a story that is I'm going to tell it to you. It's an incredible story, and it's a story that's been passed down from generations to generations about the beginning of the world and about the Santali people. And as I tell you this story, I want you to keep in mind there's been no contact with Jewish people or Christian people or the biblical story of any kind, okay? So keep that in mind. Here's their story. I'm just going to grab a drink. So the Santali people... They believed the beginning of the world was created by a god named Thakar Jui. One god, Thakar Jui, translated into English is the genuine god. So the genuine god created the world. The genuine god created one man and one woman, Haram and Oyo, translated very closely to Adam and Eve. This one man and one woman were in relationship with Thakar Jui, and they were living just fine until evil came and tempted them. And this evil being tempted them so that they would get drunk on rice beer. And that was frowned upon, but they did it anyways, and they got drunk. And as, after they woke up from their drunken stupor, they were aware of their nakedness. 
and they were embarrassed to be around the car Jewy. And so that's what happened. They had seven sons and they had seven daughters. And as a society, they became corrupt. They still knew Thakar Jui, but they didn't really care about him. And Thakar Jui was calling them back to him. But they didn't want to respond. And so Thakar Jui decided, we're going to destroy and we're going to start over again. So they grabbed a holy couple out of this corrupt civilization called the Holy Pair. They hid them in a cave. And Thakar Jui sent a flood and destroyed the whole sent the whole area and the car Jewy wanted to start over with this holy pair and so this holy pair multiplied and filled the earth i want you to keep in mind these people have never ran into jewish people the christian people they've not read the story this is this is their traditional history that they understood about the creation of the world. It is shocking to me how incredibly close it is to the biblical story and evidence to me that God is at work in people groups even before missionaries or anyone that has um, acknowledgement, acknowledgement of God arrives. So the story goes on. So out of, out of these group of people, a specific clan called the Santal people started journeying eastward. And they wanted to find a home for, their, uh, wanted to find a home for themselves. And so they were journeying eastward. And they still knew of Thakar Jui. And they hit the mountains. And presumably these are the Himalayan mountains. As they were traveling from Asia and they hit the Himalayan mountains. And they became discouraged because they could not find a way through the mountains. They still acknowledged Thakar Jui as the real and genuine God. But because they hit this impasse in the mountains, they decided we need to worship different gods. We need to worship uh, the gods of the mountains. And so they lost faith in Thakar Jui. And they descended into spiritism. And they worshiped many different spirits. Eventually they made their way through the Himalayas. And they made a covenant with all of the spirits, the spirits of the mountains and the sky and the sun. And they worshiped these spirits to appease them. And they passed through the Himalayas and they ended up settling in the plains, which is, which is where now, um, where they live now, up in West Bengal area. And today they, and they practice sorcery and spirit worship and sun worship and they totally lost their connection to Thakar Jui. And so as the elder was telling Lars Skrefrud, this history, he was incredibly sad. And he said, our elders have done a terrible thing. We once knew who the genuine God was, but our ancestors turned their back on him and they rejected him. And now we are considered an unworthy people and we have no way to get back. And so he says, we as a people are cursed and we are unworthy and there's no way for us to get back to Thakar Jui. So you can imagine the excitement of these two missionaries when they heard this story and they said, let me tell you how you can be reconciled to the genuine God. And he told them the story of the gospel and he told them about Jesus. And he says, if you want to know the genuine God, his son has come and has made it possible to be reconciled to him. And the Santal people were so excited because they had this story in their background, but they didn't know how to come back to Thakkar Jui, the genuine God. And now these missionaries have come and said, let me tell you how to be reconciled. And so the Santal people started coming to Christ and the church started growing. And I was reading accounts. There was 80 baptisms a day. In his lifetime, Skresfrud, uh, the guy up there, 15, he, in his lifetime, he baptized 15,000 Santali people. The church in Europe, had to send more missionaries because the church in India was growing so rapidly among the Santali people because it was so natural for them to come to Christ because they knew so much of the story already, they just didn't know how to be reconciled to him. What an incredible story, hey? And so there was this incredible movement amongst the Santali people, and that was 150 years ago in 1860. Um, these missionaries, so the language, the Santali language, they didn't have written form. It was only oral. And so these guys uh, created an alphabet for them and created a, a written script for them. And uh, the missionaries did incredible work amongst the Santali people. They built medical hospitals. They built schools. And they advocated to the English because the English were in charge at that time. And they said, look, these people are valuable. Don't discriminate against them. Um, and so they really uh, rose up the Santali people in, in uh, India. 150 years ago. It's an amazing success story of, of missions where you just need to go in and, and see and learn how God has been at work in a people group and then point them to the way 
point them to Christ, point them to the way that Christ has been part of that story. So that's 150 years ago. So I went into this Santali group um, three weeks ago. Today, uh, there's 9 million Santalis. Uh, it's 6% Christian. You might think that's really low considering the story that I just told you. But keep in mind, in India, the average is about, most people groups, it's about 0.1% are Christian. So it's actually a much higher percentage than most uh, Indian, uh, Indian population groups. There's nine million of them today. And obviously a lot happens over 150 years. And um, the Santalis have grown. They've, there's a huge population of them. And there's all these new villages and all these new areas. And they, many of them have not heard about Christ. And so uh, I got to go into this area. So this is where the Santalis are in, in India. So it just kind of shows you a map of India, if you know. It. So this was my introduction into, the, into a Santali area. Uh, it was this amazing welcome. So there was me and two other guys traveling. And we were the first foreigners, the first white people to go into this village. And they had this parade for us where they dressed up in their... Um, they dressed, you know, they, they dressed uh, in amazing ways and kind of paraded us through the village doing this dance and this song. And so somebody took a picture of us from the front. So you can see the three awkward white guys in the back. And like we are a lot taller than them and they're hucking flower petals at us and it's getting down our back and it's just like the most surreal experience. And then as we enter into the village, we sit down and they take our shoes off and wash our feet. That's just one of the ways that they honor uh, visitors. And it, we're just sitting there relishing this experience. And so we spent the whole day with them and there was this big conference. And um, they, showed, they did Santali uh, dance and song for us, which was amazing to watch. And then I had the opportunity to share the story that I just told you with them. So I went into this area, not sure if they would know their own history or not. And so we're gathering with about two or 300 Santalis. These are all new Christians. So all the churches that we've helped plant kind of came together for this one day conference. And so many of these are just brand new first generation Christians. And so I'm standing there telling them this story and saying, um, God cares about you. Let me tell you about how God has been at work in your history. And most of them did not know their history. So keep in mind, these are very illiterate, uneducated people. So in India, you've got the caste system. You've got the high caste, you've got the low caste, and then not even registered are tribal people. And so that's where the Santalis are. And so they're tribal. And so they, they're grow, they've, they're, they grow up believing and being told that they are unworthy and without value. So to stand up there and to tell them the story that God God has been at work in your ancestors in, since the very beginning of your people. It was an amazing story to be able to tell. A few of them knew it. The older, more experienced pastors heard the story, but the rest had not heard the story. And to be able to tie that story in and say, God loves you, God cares about you, God has been at work in your people group for a very long time, and to watch, to see it on their faces, how that was clicking with them. And they're like, wow, I'm not unworthy. God does see me. He has been at work in my life and in my culture. And it was just an amazing, uh, amazing experience to be a part of that. How do we get here? So this is, um, I feel like I'm in the way here. So this is Jermon. Jermon is one of the pastors that we've been supporting for eight years. Um, he's a great success story. So uh, we help pay his salary and say, you know, go and reach your people after training him. Um, with pastors that are pretty successful, we try to help them get on their feet. So we bought him an auto rickshaw and he uses that for his own business. So he's self-sustainable and his church grew to a point where it needed a building. So that's, that's the fancy church that they meet in there. It's kind of that tin box. The next day we got to meet their church planting team. So because of German's um, influence, he has raised up a whole bunch of leaders. And so out of this group, they all work together. They're all young pastors. Uh, we support eight of those pastors uh, in ministry, and the rest are, are volunteers, and they're part of it. And we sat down and just heard their stories, and they talk, each of them talked about different churches that they've planted in villages that never had a church before. So what they're running is the first church in their community, and they all work together. And God is doing this amazing work, again, amongst the Santali people. And uh, at the end there, or actually this is at the beginning, this is, this is a group of Bible school students. So we were there, it was winter break, so three weeks off. So what do they do? We're going to train young people. So they've got about 20 
young people, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds coming every day for three weeks to learn the Bible and learn about mission and ministry so they can go out and reach their people. They have such a passion for reaching their people and they know that they are Christians and they're called to a purpose and they're called to bring others to Christ and to grow the church. And so to be there and just encourage them and to witness this was amazing. I got to tell you one more story here. So we were... We were checking out a piece of land way out in the backwoods village area. And it was a piece of land that they wanted to buy, so they just wanted to show it to us. The taller guy on the left is our key partner. He's the guy that travels around with us and, and works with us. He was kind of our guide, our host. This lady on the right, the night before this, she had a dream. And in her dream, she saw Daniel's face. Daniel's our partner. She's never, Daniel's never been here. She's never met Daniel. No, no connection, no relationship whatsoever. But she had a dream that night. And in that dream, she saw Daniel give her a really expensive locket, something that was of incredible value. And she woke up and she was like, what is this? What, 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 what is the meaning of this? So that morning, she's driving on her scooter and she sees Daniel and we're standing there in the middle of nowhere on this piece of land and she sees him and she's like, that's the man in my dream. And she gets out and she tells Daniel, I dreamt about you last night. And she says, you have something valuable to give me. And Daniel shared the gospel with them right there and they both accepted Christ on the spot. And I was, I was standing there. I watched this whole thing happen. It was incredible. And Daniel was blown away too. He's like, I've never been in this region before. Uh, these people have no, there's, there's no way they could have known who I was. God just did an absolutely amazing thing of bringing these people to himself. So stories like that are just so cool and to be able to witness it. Oh, we're going to go back here. So let me just pause and just say, what, what are some things that we can learn about this? Some things that uh, it impacts us. I think like eternity in their hearts, that passage that I read, I think it, it really does ring true when you see how God is at work in people's lives and that they're, they're longing for more. We were made by God for God. That's what we were created for. We were created by a creator so that we would know this creator. And we're not going to find peace or rest or hope until we know this creator. So, this is what St. Augustine says, a great theologian in the 4th century, and I quote this a lot, but it's just one of the most famous ones. He says, restless are our hearts until they find rest in God alone. And we will be restless until we find that peace in the only one that can give us peace, the only one that can give us rest, because that's what we were created for. That's what eternity in our hearts mean. Um, our, the human soul is looking for God. Many don't know it. Many feel this emptiness and they're trying to fill this emptiness with stuff. You know, in our culture, it's wealth or power or, you know, the worship of self. In other cultures, it's other things. I know in India, there's a huge epidemic of, of alcoholism and drugs. Um, we see some of that here today, too, of course, in our culture. I was listening to a podcast this week and the podcaster was saying, uh, he was talking about the seven most Googled questions about God. And... Here's, the th here's three that, came, that popped out. What is the purpose in life? Is there a God? And can I know God? These are the three most popular questions asked about God, the most Googled questions. It just goes to show you that people are hungry. People are looking. People want answers. There is this void, this emptiness that we're all looking to try to fill somehow. And the truth is only God can fill it. You all know C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was a great atheist, and he set out to disprove Christianity, and in his journey to disprove it, he became a Christian, reluctantly, but he's like, it has to be true, and one of the great uh, drawing points for him was this argument of desire, and he says this, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. The most probable explanation, if you are not satisfied, if you don't have rest, if the things of this world are not doing it for you, you were made for something more. You were made for more. Eternity in your hearts. Today's society seems like, you know, we have all the comforts of life. We have it better than any generation has ever had it. And yet, statistics say we are less happy, less content than ever. Why? Because we're trying to fill it, fill that void with stuff that just doesn't do it for us. It's not going to work. 
We are restless. We will be restless until we find rest in God. And you know, in our culture, we are so distracted in North America. We're so busy. We're so consumed by what this world has to offer. We just go, 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 go. And we don't often even take time to think about the deeper things and ask the bigger questions. When I go to India, they're, they're, they are such a spiritual people and these things really matter to them. And they're really in tune with what's going on in their heart and they're looking for answers. But I think in our culture, as I look around, and why, we don't, why I don't have a lot of stories like this to say about what's happening in North America is because we're so distracted and we don't even listen to our heart and the things that our heart is saying to us. So I would say, look to your heart, listen to eternity, listen to the eternal question that is, that, that, that is, is uh, bugging you. And then missions, of course, is about alerting other people and helping them seek the answers that they are looking for uh, to life's deepest questions. One last story. Uh, three weeks ago today, I was in a church in Punjab, so at the other end of India. And so this is one, another one of our church planters that we support. His name is Deepak James. And I preached a message similar to this. I was preaching about the woman at the well in John 4, where she was, uh, where Jesus offered her living water. And that's so much more than anything that this world can offer. And I talked about how God satisfies us and quenches our thirst. And at the end of the sermon, Deepak James came up to me. He says, you preached what I've experienced in my life. Like you just nailed it because this is what I've experienced in my life. And then he sat down and told me his story. Deepak James was born into a wealthier family in India. He had everything that he needed. He was a self-proclaimed atheist. He said, I was better. I thought I was better than anything that religion could offer me. And religion was just a crutch. He got into philosophy. He got into humanism and he tried to find the answers there. But then, and he took a lot of pride in it. But then as time progressed, as a young man, he just wasn't finding the peace. He wasn't finding the rest that he was looking for. And he started looking for it elsewhere. And he says he got deep into alcohol and into drugs. And he says he got really caught up in that scene, trying to like fill that restlessness that he really, really felt. And he knew, and he says it satisfied him for a little bit. And then it just didn't do the job anymore. And he says he got to the point in his life where he wanted to commit suicide. I've heard so many stories, in India especially, that is this story, of Indians who know there's something deeper that they need, and they look for it, and they can't find it, and then they want to end their life. I've heard this testimony so many times. So Deepak James was just about ready to end it when a pastor came into his village and started talking about Jesus. Deepak James decided he would start learning a little bit about Jesus and go to Bible study, but he just wasn't sure. And one day when he was really depressed, he closed his eyes, and he couldn't open them. It was like God had shut his eyes shut, and he was scared. And in the darkness of his eyelids, it said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Stop looking everywhere else. And then he could open his eyes again. He told me this story. And he says, in that moment, Jesus spoke to me and showed me that he is the answer to all the questions that I've had, to all the restlessness that I've felt in my life. And he gave up everything. And he's a, he's a poor pastor now, pastoring a thriving church. And he said, for the first time in his life, he's like, I found the peace that I'd always been looking for. I found, I, I filled that void, that emptiness, that eternity that was calling out, I finally found the answer, he said. And he's like, I would do nothing else right now than be a pastor and try and point other people so they can experience what I've experienced. And just to hear those testimonies, and I hear them over and over again in India, is just amazing. Friends, Jesus is the answer to our quest for meaning. He is the answer. He is the one that will answer that eternity in your heart that is calling for more than what this world can possibly give you. He's the answer for your need for purpose, your desire to be loved. He's the one who shows us how to live. He's the one that shows us what's true about ourselves and what's true about the world. He's the one that makes sense of who you are and what you're called to do. It is in Christ that you will find the answers to the things that are, that are deep within. And so God is on mission. God is working in our world. He's working here. And he invites us to be a part of it. And I think what inspires me so much is we're not just spectators. 
I don't want to just sit back and watch. I want to be a part of it. And God invites us in and he says, you are part of the mission of God. And so, yeah, not everyone gets to go to Guatemala and India, but we're all called to places. In your workplace, in your home, in your neighborhood, we're all called to live missionally. Missions isn't just something when you get on a plane and go somewhere else that you do. We're all called to alert our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers to the ways in which God is at work in their lives, to help them realize that eternity is in their heart and that Christ is the only answer to filling that. So we want to make others aware of God's presence and his goodness. I'm going to end with this verse. We are, we're working our way through the book of Revelations. Jeremy just started that last week. And so I wanted to find a verse that I thought really spoke to this um, this intimacy, this connection that God wants to have with us, with his people. And so Jesus says this, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. It's the heart of Jesus. And he wants, he wants to come in and he wants to dine with us. He wants to fill that void. He wants to answer that eternity in our hearts. He wants to fill that restlessness that we all have. And we all have it because we were created by God for God. And if we're created by God, but we're not trying to fill that void with God, it's not going to work. It's just simply not going to work. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm here and I'm waiting and I'm ready, but you have to invite me in. You have to let me in and then I will eat and I will dine with you. This beautiful passage in Revelations. So I hope, I hope that you're inspired. I hope that you're encouraged. God is at work, and we got to be a part of it. You know, being a Christian isn't just about going to heaven when we die and saying a prayer. Being a Christian is about participating with what God is doing in our world, and making the world a better place, and engaging with what He's doing. So, uh, yeah, God is good. And it's such a privilege to follow him and to know him and to be a part of what he is doing. So let me pray. God, I thank you so much for your love and for your goodness. I thank you that you are the answers to life's deepest issues. I thank you for the way that you are working the world, Lord. And I pray specifically for the church in India, for our brothers and sisters in Christ there, Lord, that you would, that you would help the church grow and expand and that many more people would move from darkness to light. And God, I pray for us here at Creekside that we would know you and love you and that knowing and that loving would overflow into mission with our friends and our family and our neighbors, Lord. Help us to see the ways in which you are at work around us and to participate with you, Lord, I pray. God, we pray your kingdom come. We pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Christ's name, amen.